Um, but we will do a little bit of a whistle stop tour. So we'll talk about HIV and we'll talk about chemsex and sexual violence. The first section of today will be why do gay, bisexual, men, sex and men face unique health challenges? The second section will be talking about chemsex, defining it and understanding kind of what are people's motivations to engage in chemsex? And the last one is uh, to talk about sexual violence among gay, bisexual, men, sex men. And fi- finally, we'll finish with a conclusive exercise. Now, why do gay, bisexual, men, sex and men face unique challenges? In, within this first section, we will talk about the unique health disparities among gay, bisexual, men, sex and men. We'll talk about the early HIV epidemic and the rise of homophobia. We'll talk about the group, ex- we'll do a group exercise together. Uh, it's called the stereotype spectrum. Uh, Then we'll talk about the minority stress model and then we'll talk about the impact of the minority stress model. We'll have a little Q&A and then we'll take a five minute break. Does that all sound good to people? Give me a thumbs up if it does. Yeah, cute, cute, cute. Okay, so I thought it'd be appropriate maybe just to start today's session off with giving a little bit of an overview of the prevalence of all the issues that I'm going to touch upon today. I'm not going to spend too much time on this slide, but it will just help give a little bit of context to... Yeah, just how many people are affected by these particular issues. Now, the first one that I was going to mention is HIV and sexual health. This is not really going to be the focus of today's session, but just for context, 10% of gay, bisexual, men, and sex and men in the EMIS report in 2017 reported living with HIV. And some studies, and it really depends on which country you live on, but it ranges between 36 to 69 percent of gay of uh, people living with HIV uh, identify as gay, bisexual, or men who are sexual men. That's really dependent on what country you live in, like, and what your HIV epidemic looks like. So let's say in somewhere like Ireland, where I'm from, our HIV epidemic was largely focused on the heroin using population of city centres. That's more similar, like, with Italy and other southern European countries. Um, compared to maybe more like uh, Western European countries like uh, France and Germany and England, where it was largely focused on gay, bisexual men and sexual men. So a little bit of variety, but still it's a key population within it. Uh, the next thing that we will be looking up is chemsex. So according to the EMIS report, now d- are people familiar with what the EMIS report are? Give me a thumbs up if you're familiar with the EMIS report. Thumbs up, thumbs up. I see... Oh my God, I also just realized we missed one person in the introductions. Annalisa, I'm so sorry. I hope you didn't feel left out. No problem. Okay, okay. Would you give us just a really quick introduction to who you are? Okay, I am Annalisa. I'm from Italy. I am a psychiatrist and I work in an addiction unit. So I think that uh, uh, chemsex is a challenging topic and I hope to learn uh, the more possible in this section. Yeah, amazing. Thank you so much. Apologies for that. No problem. Uh, you'll definitely get that into today's session. Um, yeah, so the EMIS report, like many people are familiar with, is one of the largest online surveys uh, conducted among gay, bisexual, men and sexual men in Europe. Uh, they found within that study that 15 to 33 percent of men who have sex with men engage in chemsex. Now, I'll, I will tell you this right here, right now. That is most definitely an underreporting of the prevalence of chemsex within the community. You'll find that when you're engaging with people that the word chemsex is really helpful for us as service providers, but many people who engage in chemsex don't really see it as that. And I'll tell you this, is like, when I have a conversation with my queer men, male friends, and I ask them, oh, did you engage in chemsex last week? The answer is probably no, because of the stigma attached to it. And quite specific image that people have in mind when they hear the word chemsex but if I ask them what they did they'll say well I went to the club and then after it I invited a few guys over to my house and we used 3mmc to party and have sex and it was just a chill out you know so I have a little bit of an understanding that this could be an underreporting due to the stigma around the word chemsex now the next thing that was uh, this actually statistic comes from the chemsex service I ran in the UK for two years and I just thought it was really interesting because it really indicated the prevalence of just how many people were coming to the service with chemsex as their primary issue which was one in five service users were presenting with to Terence Higgins Trust uh, counseling with chemsex as their main concern and now the next one uh, which I think really indicates how this is disproportionately affecting gay, bisexual, men of sex and men, 
is uh, that GBMSM report a rate of injecting drug use that is around 10 times higher than their heterosexual counterparts. So yeah, that will just give you a little bit of an overview of the prevalence. Now the next one would be sexual violence. That will be the last topic that we touch upon today. When it comes to sexual violence, 25% of gay and bisexual men have been sexually assaulted in the last 12 months. That's a quarter of gay and bisexual men have sex with men have been sexually assaulted in the last year, one in four. And then again, similarly to the chemsex studies, there's often an underreporting found. You'll find a resistance among gay, bisexual, gay and bisexual GBMSM to um, uh, recognize and experience as sexual assault. So within this UK study we have here, uh, in the third box to the right is basically they switched the language in the study so that rather than saying have you been raped in the last year or have you been sexually assaulted in the last year they changed it to have you been taken advantage of or have your boundaries been crossed and they found when they shifted the language away from something that held a lot of stigma like rape and sexual violence that the reporting went a lot higher. They found that 48% of men reported sexual violence in the past five years. Great, so we're gonna hop into our first topic of the day, which is HIV. Really, I wanted to cover HIV because I think it really gives a huge amount of context to these prevalent issues like chemsex and HIV. And what I really wanted to focus on is the relationship the HIV epidemic had on exacerbating homophobia within our societies. And what we found is that when the HIV epidemic emerged within society, that the public response enduringly and pervasively characterized this epidemic as a gay plague, you know, that this was something really perpetuated by fear and misinformation and these negative stereotypes that had already been associated with gay bisexual men but we're given suddenly so much more permission to be placed within the public eye, you know, that HIV had been brought upon the, uh, brought upon gay and bisexual men and sex with men because of their perceived deviancy, you know, that their social um, transgressive behaviors had meant that this was a godly, a divine punishment that had come down to smite them. So you can really understand that with that enduring narrative of the gay plague, just how much homophobia was being fueled by this. There's even reports that from people who were alive pre and post uh, early HIV epidemic is that they found is that Actually, after Stonewall, there was quite an uptick in the movement towards queer civil rights and that the HIV epidemic was actually a massive setback. It was nearly like you could get away with being a covert community before the HIV epidemic. And when the HIV epidemic happened, it suddenly was in the public eye and there was no hiding for gay, bisexual men of sex with men. So there was huge public fear and misinformation, you know, it was really widespread and was often exaggerated by religion and cultural norms. There was loads of misinformation about how HIV and AIDS were transmitted, which really, again, exacerbated these irrational fears and discriminatory behaviors towards gay and bisexual men and, all, and ultimately resulted in this total social ostracization of queer men. And what you also found on top of that is that queer men not only battled against this external pressure, but they also found that they started internalizing this external response and opinion and narrative into their own communities where suddenly there was major stigma even being perpetuated by gay and bisexual men and sexual men that was deeply rooted in homophobia. And this is where you start to see the emergence of the, the good gay, the assimilated fits into straight society, and then the deviant queer, you know, somebody who fights against the cultural norm or engages in sexual behaviors that is not seen as status quo. 
does this relationship between HIV and homophobia make sense to people? Can you put your fingers in the air, thumbs in the air, not fingers, if that makes sense? If it doesn't, let me know. Okay, I think people are generally getting on the same page. Great. So we're going to go straight into an exercise. I'm going to put you into breakout rooms. How exciting is that? Um, I love the breakout rooms because I get 10 minutes just to disassociate while you guys do all the work, you know? Um, so now, okay. So what is the impact of having all these messages stuck in your head? Well, that is exactly what we're going to dive into right now because we're going to talk a little bit about the minority stress model. Now, can anybody give me a thumbs up if they have ever heard of the minority stress model? Tabita, a little, we, I see a little shake in here and there. Okay, we have like a little bit of consensus here and there, but this is really the foundation for what we're talking about today. So to say it in its most simplest terms, minority stress uh, basically means that sexual minorities face unique and hostile stressors like internalized homophobia, like we just mentioned, related to their sexual minority identity. Now, if we're going to get into the academically definition of it, we have it here in Meyer in 1995, where he said, the concept of minority stress stems from several social and psych psychological theoretical orientations that can be described as a relationship between minority and the dominant values and result in conflict with uh, social environments experienced by minority group members. Now, what is that in more plain English? Well, I can tell you, it is minority stress theory proposes that sexual minority health disparities can be explained in a large part by the stressors induced by a hostile homophobic culture, which often results in a lifetime of harassment, maltreatment, discrimination, and victimization, and may ultimately impact access to care. Does that make sense to people? Give me a thumbs up if it does, and give me a thumbs down if it doesn't. Yeah, grand, grand, grand. Okay, so basically what it proposes is that you know, you know, the way that I like to think about it is it's a little bit like if you grow up in a society that is ultimately built against you in many ways, it really chips away at somebody's self-esteem, you know? So your self-esteem is really the value you place on yourself as a person. And that's an ultimately a major motivator behind much of our health behavior is seeing ourselves as worth working for or worth saving or worth improving. So it really is an underlying basis for the struggle that many people, many queer men have towards improving their health. Okay, so we're going into the second section of today's, uh, of today's workshop, which is ChemSex. Uh, we'll be talking a little bit about what is chemsex. We'll be talking about how the minority stress model extends to gay sex and ultimately impacts uh, why gay men engage in chemsex. We'll talk about why do GBFSM engage in chemsex. Uh, we'll do a little exercise focused on case studies. And then again, we'll have another little five minute break before we head into our, our final section of today. Um, yeah, let's get into it. So what is chemsex? Now, it's probably the question I get asked the most is really what is chemsex, you know? And it's, it's a little bit more complicated than it looks. Um, on the surface level, many people will think that chemsex is sexualized drug use. That is not the case, you know? So chemsex is not sexualized drug use. Sexualized drug use is just the incidental use of drugs before or during sex. However, chemsex, on the other hand, is the use and plan of using specific drugs to enhance, prolong, or facilitate a sexual experience. Does that make sense to people? So it's not just, oh my God, I was taking coke last night and, and I fucked somebody. No, it's really, I use this drug to make my sex longer, faster, harder, stronger. Oh my God, did I just quote Kanye West? <laughs> I think I did. Um, now, what are the specific drugs in, uh, in question? 
is GHB GBL. So that's like maybe uh, informally known as liquid ecstasy. It's uh, the gamma hydroxy butrate is the chemical compound in which uh, is in it. GHB is quite a dangerous drug in the grand scheme of things. It's very easy to overdose because it's an extremely toxic substance. It's a, an extremely toxic depressant. Now, you can have lots of fun on GHB and not experience an overdose, but there's no such thing as kind of a safe dosage of G. It really depends on the day that person's metabolism, maybe how much they've eaten. So it's a really hit or miss drug. You obviously have crystal meth, which I'm sure you're all familiar with from Breaking Bad and other pop cultural type of things. I once had, uh, I once was doing a workshop like this and I asked people, oh, why do you think chem sex is, or crystal meth is so popular in chem sex scenes? And I had this one straight guy who turned the group and he was like, it's a Breaking Bad. The Breaking Bad's do it. And I was like, oh, well, thank you so much. Um, okay. And the last one would be these designer cathinone drugs like 4-MMC and 3-MMC. Now, I have just given you a definition for chemsex. However, as service providers, it's helpful for us to have a definition for chemsex because it helps us identify an issue and it helps us write our grant applications to the government and make an appeal for this issue to be addressed. However, in reality, it's a lot broader than this specific definition, you know? Within this definition, you see it being like talking about gay, bisexual men and sex with men. In reality, there's many queer women who engage in chemsex. There's many trans people who engage in chemsex. And there's also this link with these specific drugs. When in reality, you know, there's often other drugs in the mix in the chemsex scene, like ketamine or cocaine or um, even poppers and erectile dysfunction medication. So having these strict definitions, it's a little bit of a give and take. There, it's helpful for us because we can identify the issue a little bit more accurately but maybe not so helpful when you have the actual complexities that service users attend uh, services with. Now, Povi, you have your hand up. What's on your mind? I just want to ask again, since, um, I, as I was telling you before, is it a combination or is it enough when you use one of them? It's enough if you use one of them. Okay. That, yeah. yeah. Thank you. Yeah, you don't have to hit all three to get the chem sex qualification. Often you'll find is that one drug in particular is the problem drug for service users. Uh, often the people who will be presenting to your services and report uh, chem sex as an issue will have one primary drug of choice, you know. And that will really depend on the city as well. So like in places like Berlin, uh, GBL is the most common chemsex drug. In places like London, you have crystal meth is a lot more popular. So the trends are very much based on the city and the availability and access to certain drugs and how cheap stuff is also has a really big influence on what people use as chemsex drugs. There's also like a key aspect of all these drugs that makes them chems, which is that they're all easily sexualizable. So it's not like ecstasy or MDMA where you can't, many men are not able to maintain an erection or they're not able to ejaculate using ecstasy. So it wouldn't be used in this context because it wouldn't be applicable enough or even ketamine, you know, it can cause people to become disassociated from their body. So it wouldn't be as easily sexualized as let's say GHB, which makes people really, really horny and lowers people's inhibitions, or crystal meth, which shoots your dopamine levels through the roof and, of course, sends you into a real, like, uh, heightened sense of sex and euphoria. And then 4-MMC and 3-MMC are a similar, in a similar way to crystal meth, affect your dopamine and result in that kind of increased sense of horniness. Does anybody have any questions about the drugs before I move on? Because I won't be diving too much into the drug side of things. We'll be going more into the theoretical side of why, why chem sex is such an issue. So does anybody have any questions just before we move on? Nope. Nope. Cool. Uh, great. So 
We talked about this minority stress model, which proposes that, you know, sexual minorities face unique hostile stressors that result in these particularly health, vul- these uh, particular health vulnerabilities. Now, the man who coined the term chemsex was this man called David Stewart. And really, when he was defining the term chemsex, he really went into explaining that, like, these drugs have been around since before chemsex, you know? G has been around, crystal meth has been around, cathinones are pretty new, but similar compounds have been present. And you know, the combination of sex and drugs is nothing new either, you know? Think about rock and roll, like, as in these are things that, themes that have been present within pop culture. However, what David Stewart explained is that so much of chemsex is actually explained by the factors that facilitate this particularly disproportionate use of drugs and sex together among gay, gay bisexual men and sexual men. So just say that one more time. Chemsex is mo- ultimately framed by the factors that facilitate it within the gay and bisexual men and sexual men community. That's why it's uh, defined for gay and bisexual men. And ultimately what David did is that he extended the minority stress model to better understand what is stopping gay I'm just going to say gay men because it's easier for me. But when I say gay men, I mean GBMSM and trans and non-binary people. Um, what is preventing gay men from having healthy, uh, sober sexual activities with each other? And he identified these factors. It included things like the societal attitudes around homophobia or the si- societal attitudes around homosexuality, which we touched upon, of course, in the first few slides around the uh, early HIV epidemic and the hate homophobic response to it. Um, but really, these societal attitudes, particularly the ones that, that manifested in the disgust of the Gay Sex Act, you'll actually find with a lot of homophobic people that when they think of gay men, they find it very difficult not to focus on the act of sodomy or the act of anal sex. They find that really disgusting. So that can be really omnipresent within society and cultural norms. The next one would be cultural and religious attitudes towards homosexuality can seriously inhibit one's enjoyment of gay sex. There's also, of course, the trauma and stigma of the AIDS epidemic can seriously impact one's enjoyment of gay sex. I'll, get, I'll tell you a story about that, actually. So when I came out as gay to my lovely little Irish mammy, she accepted, accepted me being gay after some tears um, upon one condition, you know? I wasn't allowed to come home with HIV. You know, so you can imagine, like, with that stigma being baked into the psyche of queer men that when they go towards sex there's a constant sense of fear now that fear has been really reduced because of the accessibility to prep and stuff like that but i'll tell you this hiv remains the boogeyman that lives underneath queer men's bed now the next one would be the technological sexual revolution that has occurred with the arrival of hookup apps and smartphone technology this is seriously changed the way that queer men navigate and negotiate sex you know so suddenly you have access to this app on your phone that you basically can whenever you want get sex if you live in an urban area so I always think of grind you're familiar with grinder is everybody familiar with grinder put your thumbs in the air if you are yeah familiar with grinder yeah cool yeah, I'd be really worried if you didn't <laughs> know that. Um, but yeah, so like with the invention of Grinder, like it has just created, and you know, I use it myself. So I really mean this in like the least judgmental way possible. But it's like having a gambling app on your phone, you know, that you can pull the jackpot every time. You know, it really has made this culture where, you know, people have learned to market themselves, you know. And on top of that, it has like a very specific relationship with chemsex and the networks in which chemsex exists upon. And we'll dive into that in the next slide. But just just to explain a little bit about what culture has been created on these apps, we have this gay specific culture, born rejection culture born out of the hookup apps. It's associated with these gay tribes, you know, twinks go with daddies, muscles go with muscles, otters go with bears, like 
this thing that based on body shape and fitness, race and sexual performance expectations, plus the ability to market oneself in order to be successful within that culture. If you're a gay man in this uh, workshop, you'll be much familiar with the ability to hit upon the notes on Grindr or play all the notes on Grindr so that you will get what you're looking for. You know, it's quite transactional in that nature. And that really makes it... um. Yeah, often more difficult for people to find meaningful connections. And then the last one would be the dangers associated with gay sex. So be it, you know, living in a homophobic society where, where there is very present dangers of being hate crimes via gay, gay hookup apps or even in public. Now, obviously, there's that's a double-sided sword in a sense because the danger around gay sex is also sometimes the thing that makes it better and sometimes the thing that makes it worse. Is there a bit of any questions about these factors that make it more difficult for gay men to enjoy sex? Nope. Nope. Um, maybe. Um, yeah, go on, Peter. Yeah, well, what you said that uh, men are uh, now um, learned how to market themselves. So you have to look in a certain way, you have to d belong into some category. And... Um, yeah, this is the basic of this uh, <laughs> fucked up thing. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah, exactly. Like, and I, I think what uh, I think it was Annalisa mentioned it in the previous exercise about you know having all of these stereotypes in your head as well, and having the difficulty with your own identity because of that. You can imagine how that's only exaggerated and exacerbated when you're like put into this realm now, where you're also expected to fit into certain categories, not fit in certain categories so that you can feel desirable to your peers, you know? So it's a lot of pressure. It's a lot of pressure on queer men in these sexual settings. Now, why do we engage in camp sex? Before we get into this, can, can anybody tell me, what, why do you think people engage in camp sex? Well, maybe if I can. Uh, this is just exactly what I said before. They uh, with this, they it's easier for them to fit in a certain group or just to 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 relax thinking about it, what they really are, what they want. Yeah, yeah, I think that's a really good way of putting it. It's a sense of escape. Yeah, you know, or also the... loneliness behind it and mm. disconnection. Really fundamental human needs, you know, connection, overcoming loneliness. Can anybody think about, you know, some of the stuff we mentioned earlier? Is there anything else that people might be using these drugs to cope with? Yeah, you already mentioned is the beginning to enhance or prolong the sexual practice. Or yeah. They can be like a pretty hurt, relaxed, or if they're much too relaxed. Yeah, so in de dealing with the external homophobic input and the internalized homophobic process, yeah, these are all really great examples, folks. So to dive into it a little bit deeper, we have some of the various factors and reasons why somebody might engage in chemsex. Now, the first one is the geospatial apps. Now, I obviously told you about you know the culture that had been born out of the geospatial apps. That can explain to you the sexual side of chemsex, you know, so... It can explain to you why people are looking to cope with the sexual side. But what about the drugs side of it? Like, what about the drug side of chemsex? And how do geospatial apps play a role in people's access to drugs? Now, I'll tell you. So there's a little story I can tell you. Now, there's two boys. They're 18 years old and they're moving to the city. We'll call one boy Joe Bloggs and we'll call the other boy Gay Joe Bloggs. Now, straight Joe blogs and gay Joe blogs, they live in rural England, let's say, and they move from rural England to London. Now, when straight Joe blogs comes to London, he's five degrees of separation from Crystal Map. He'll have to go one, two, three, four, five people, five loops of social circles before he gets to Crystal Map. Now, for gay Joe blogs, when he gets to London, he also has five degrees of separation before him and Crystal met. However, now that he has access to Grinder in an urban area, suddenly he can just jump all the way to network five 
you know? So it changes his ability to access certain specific drugs because of the networks that are present on spaces like Grindr. Does that make sense to people? Give me a thumbs up if it does. Amazing, amazing. Okay, now the next thing that I would say is drugs are fun. I love drugs. Um, many people love drugs, you know? It's a form of experimentation. Uh, it was something that I found really, really difficult when I was younger. Um, I grew up in the countryside in Ireland and I did not know people did drugs. Like, really, I didn't. I thought that rich people like movie stars do cocaine and then poor people do heroin. And I didn't realize that there was anything in between, you know? So you come to you come to the urban city or urban to college and whatever and you find, oh, my God, there's actually this full culture of people who use drugs recreationally and that's particularly true within the queer community and I have a quote here from one of my favorite articles which basically proposes that drugs are a significant component in the subcultural practices and spaces of pleasure upon which urban gay identity has been built so it's quite an integral part of gay culture now the next one we're going to talk about is ritualized comfort seeking now when we talk about chemsex we don't often talk about addiction, at least within my own services. We had a little bit of a move away from the term addiction because addiction really, for me, speaks to the chemical process that is happening in people's brains, you know? So really like addiction is a process in which somebody has a dependency on a drug and then suffers withdrawal symptoms. Now that is indeed true for people who become addicted to GHB, but other drugs have less of that relationship. So what we really defined it as is, is like, how are people using these drugs to self-medicate existing vulnerabilities that are already present in their lives? Um, and then again, they're trying to self-medicate these existing vulnerabilities, not just through the drugs and the escapism, but also what they are achieving from attending chemsex parties or chemsex sessions, which is a sense of belonging, you know, or seeking intimacy or va val val validation, there we go, uh, looking for validation, uh, a sense of community, you know, these are things that we can all relate to. The next one I would see quite often with in running a chemsex service was neurodivergence, you know, so we had a lot of people who with problematic levels of chemsex use, finding that they were neurodivergent, maybe ADHD or ADD. As you can imagine, like, you know, crystal meth is actually uh, like one degree of chemical separation from Ritalin, which is one of the most popular drugs used to treat ADHD. Uh, I remember I once had a client and he told me, yeah, when I use crystal meth, I, I just feel really calm, you know, and that's really made me giggle because that should be the exact opposite of what crystal meth does. Crystal meth should have you going through the roof energy wise, but because of the crystal meth was actually uh, medicating by accident his ADHD, he was finding it was really helping him in many ways. So again, it's me, the chemsex is meeting a certain real need. Now, the last one that we're going to talk about is psychosexual dysfunction. So this is things like erectile dysfunction or premature ejaculation. You'll find that a lot of men who engage in chemsex are using the chemsex drugs to overcome some of these sexual dysfunctions or insecurities, be it using G to delay ejaculating or using crystal meth to enhance their erectile function. Before we move on to the next section, does anybody have any questions about these different uh, motivators to engaging in chemsex? Nope. Okay, slain. Um, great, so we're going into another exercise. Okay, I think everybody's back in from the breakout rooms. <laughs> what we're going to do is I will read the case study for those who haven't had the opportunity to read it. And then we'll have a little bit of a discussion with obviously the first group who took case study one and then the second group with case study two. And then both groups took case study three. So we'll talk about that as a collective. Um, okay, so let's read this first case study. 
have to refine this. Um, here we go. Okay, the name of our first client is Ivan. Ivan is a young man of 25. Ivan has never identified himself as bisexual. Uh, he said that he always hated gay stuff. Uh, in my head, I heard my father's voice. He had always said that gays were a mis mistake of evolution. I was ashamed. I'd constantly thought about what I felt when I had sex. He started engaging in chemsex more and more often, first once a month and then every two weeks, and finally once or twice a week. Without meth, short for methadrone or 4-MMC, even looking at guys is disgusting for me. When I'm sober, I think about how I ruined my life with my own hands, that I'm a mistake, that I shouldn't exist, and I have to change. But with meth, such thoughts don't bother me. I can have sex. Later, even passed away, gotten into an argument with his boss at work and engaged in chemsex to relieve the stress and overdosed on gamma hydroxybutrate at one of the parties. Now, group one, can anybody talk to me a little bit about what were your feelings when you read this first case study? Anybody? I think it was Tabita, Annalisa, Ada. Well, um, I mean, it's it was very sad. <laughs> this is a particular. I don't know, I don't know if that's if that's. Yeah, I don't know. It just you know, like it feels like he's driven by shame. There's a lot of shame, a lot of internalized homophobia. Uh, Yeah. Yeah. So I think I think you hit the nail on the head in many forms. Sorry, folks. Just need to connect my earphones real quick. They're not connecting properly. Okay. One second. Sorry. Let me just close the door. There we go. Okay. So yeah, like you said, there's lots of shame there. This is a particularly sad case. You know, there's there's some other stuff present, but I'll leave. Anybody else to identify those? What else is present in this? So we got the shame. Anybody else? What else is present in this case? Annalisa. We have discussed about uh, probably um, his comfort seeking because there is a, a judge inside your head, his head and so he doesn't know how to do what to do. It's uh, looking about uh, himself. Yeah, yeah. It's permanently self-conscious when yeah. having sex. He's unable to let go without the drugs. Who else was in your group, Annalisa? Um, I would say uh, me, Nora. <laughs> um, I'd say that um, all of or the majority of the thoughts uh, related to this was because of his father that he imposed kind of like this trauma or stereotypes about being a mistake, a mistake of evolution. Yeah. And yeah. Well done, Nora, you're exactly right. Like, so you could even, you could see it in the way that he spoke about himself. You know, he heard his father call gay people a mistake of evolution. And then, you know, when his life was crumbling apart, the first thing that came to his head is that I I am the mistake, you know, I'm the mistake and that's why things are going wrong for me. So you can imagine how disabling that could be for somebody looking to make any meaningful change to their life. So well, thank you so much, girls, for your contribution. That was really helpful. And you hit the nail on the head. So within this story, uh, without the quote that really stood out to me was without it, without it. Even looking at guys is disgusting for me, you know? So chemsex is a permission to have sex with the man. Now, another thing that you could identify within the story is that he had never identified himself as a bisexual man. Can anybody tell me what this means? Anybody? If he's not gay and he's not bisexual and he's having sex with men, who what category would you put him in? Men who have sex with men? Yes. Thank you so much, Ada. I dared, I was like, how do I say this without saying men who have sex with men? Like, uh, you're dead right. In man of sex with man, you know? It's funny. Before working in the service world, um, I used to be like, oh my God, like they're just straight guys who can't admit that they're not, they're gay. You know what I mean? And 
I was like, oh, just someday they'll cop on and they'll be, they'll realize they're gay. Not a helpful attitude to have when trying to compassionately provide support to these men, you know, for them. What they don't identify, it's not the sexual behavior. They know that they have sex with men. They know that they like having sex with men. They don't identify with all the gay stuff. You know what I mean? They don't identify with the queer community, you know? And you'll find within the area of can sex is that a lot of men who identify as men of sex and men have that uncomfortability with gay sex. So then they reach for the cans to facilitate the sexual experiences that they want to have, maybe particularly sexual experiences like bottoming or fisting, things that they might see as more taboo. Now, we'll go on to the next case study. Um, this case study is about Igor. Igor is a young man of 28. He's very tall, fit and sporty. When Igor says that he has never felt ugly, unattractive or unworthy of attention. Four years ago, during a routine health checkup, Igor tested positive for HIV. He said that he took it calmly, just as another thing he had to deal with and take care of his health. About six months after being initiated on antiretroviral therapy, Igor started meeting people again for sex and dating and faced stigma related, related to his HIV status. All of a sudden, it turned out that all of the things that were attractive about me meant nothing. HIV changes the way people look at you. For the first time in my life, I was facing rejections and couldn't do anything about it. So like HIV put a mark on me. I could no longer have sex with whom I wanted to. Now, despite of who I am, it was not dependent on me but on what the guy, who I might not even be attracted to, thought about my HIV status. Once Eager agreed to have group sex with Kems because he said, with drugs, nobody cares if you have HIV or not. Okay, so, on to the... Oh, I'm revealing the answers. Well, I mean, you should kind of know. Uh, okay, the second group. Who is going to go first? Peter, how about yourself? Um... Mm. Yeah, what can I say? It's um um he nobody cared if he has HIV or not. This was the perception in his, his head, yes. Yeah. Um, this one this one's not as complicated, maybe, or there's not as many factors present within this case study. But yeah, you you got it. It's it's really the relationship between how he's managing the stigma that he receives within the queer queer community. So the, the quote that stood out to me is, with drugs, nobody cares if you have HIV or not. So chemsex is a way to deal with the stigma inside the community. Now, to go on to the final one, everybody got to read this one, so we'll talk about it together. And for me, it's probably the most interesting case study out of the three. Now, Ilya is 36 years old. He calls himself an unremarkable guy. Ilya is gay. He recognized and understood it back when he was very young. I rarely had sex, once every two or three months, usually with guys who were five or seven years younger than me, as I couldn't feel like a real man in bed with someone my own age. But even when I had sex, I was not able to relax. I was constantly thinking about my partner. Was he disgusted? Was he, lo was he looking at me, at my body? Actually, I always thought that gay sex is wrong and dirty. I thought I was going to a drug den. Yet, when I entered the room, I saw some nice guys. There were about 15 people. Nobody was having sex. People were just talking and drinking tea. As soon as I came in, I felt embarrassed. I saw the most beautiful guy and decided that I had no chance with him. So I should just keep to myself uh, away from him. I thought that I'd probably have sex with the boy who brought me there and then go home to sleep. When it all started, I tried methadone. My heart was pounding. So at first I was very scared and wanted to run away. In the hallway on the way to the bathroom, there was a floor mirror and I looked at myself. I liked my arms and my legs, probably for the first time since I was very young. So I took my t-shirt off and looked at my body. I liked my body. I did not seem fat or ugly. I liked myself. I felt relaxed and really, really horny. The guy whom I liked most of all came up to me and gave me a kiss. I stayed there for two days. I did not want to leave. As I knew for sure, at least for those several days, I would like myself and what I would be having the sex that I like. Okay, it's a bit of an intense one. Anybody else want to hop in on this and tell me a little bit about what their initial thoughts were? How about yourself, Alan? You are on mute. Sorry. 
Um, well, I think just towards the end of the couple of minutes, um, Ariana made a good point about um, how the there wasn't there's not necessarily like a negative part to the story in in as far as it is written at the moment. Um, and so it seems like he had a, a very positive experience and in, enjoyed how he felt using the drugs and how he saw himself. Um, but another thing um, that we briefly just mentioned at the end was about how, yeah, the stereotype of the people who might be using drugs might be different in these scenarios because he had a perception that he might be entering like a drug den. Sort of. He had an idea of the type of people that might be there and then actually they were quite different and like, I guess, normal or friendly, you know, nice, friendly, drinking tea. And I think that's quite an interesting thing to to note about this because it's I think it's quite fair to say that a lot of people who engage in chemsex are not maybe necessarily the people that we would always stereotype as as typical drug users. Um, and yeah, I think that we yeah I I mean there's just just before you go on to anything else I just really want to touch upon what you just said because it's so so important uh as usual Alan coming in with the most beautiful points um yeah that that's a really important thing to note upon is that you know the drug users the drug using population who engage in chem sex are not the typical or historical uh, population that is kind of stereotypically associated with really problematic use of drugs or intravenous drug use. So it was it's kind of funny. It's that like, um, you know, when chemsex became more of a news story in 2015, people went crazy because they were like, oh, my God. The bankers, they're doing crystal meth. Oh my God, can you believe it? Can you believe all these people who work in KPMG and Google and Facebook and all these great places to work and all these normal people are engaging in drug use like this, you know? People found that really shocking. But in reality, it's actually just challenging our stereotypes of what it means to use drugs, you know? It's really easy for us to what do what we did in the past with the heroin epidemics of Europe, which was say, oh, well, I'm nothing like those. Those are junkies. You know what I mean? These are people who use drugs. We were able to other this population. But when GBMSM started engaging in chemsex in the way that they did, people found this really shocking that somebody could be maybe of a wealthier socioeconomic class and be engaging in drug use like this. It's so taboo. But really what it does is just shows us is that yeah like drug use of this style is not reserved to one population of people we all have the capacity to engage in drugs recreationally or engage in drugs in a problematic way and that leads me perfectly on to kind of my next point which is that not all chemsex is problematic you know there's a spectrum of chemsex related behavior and that's really important for us as service providers and people who support community members is that it can be really easy for us to demonize all chemsex, you know. Oh my God, this is the next big problem in the community is chemsex. But there's many people who engage in chemsex and it will never become an issue for them. They will always have a recreational and enjoyable relationship with it. And what you might find is that for many users, the benefit of positive experiences, such as the sexual exploration and the boosting of self-confidence, will outweigh the minor harms, such as the calm downs in the days afterwards, or the financial costs incurred. Does that make sense to people? You know, it lives on a spectrum and there's different factors that will protect somebody's recreational relationship with chems. And those protective factors include things like harm reduction strategies, so understanding how to take these drugs in a manner of which will reduce any of the harms or risks associated with it. So that could be using a timesheet for G. It could be knowing accurate, knowing your doses. What's a small dose? What's a medium dose? What's a large dose? It could be using clean needles when slamming drugs. <clears throat> Does everybody know what slamming means? Put your thumbs in the air if you know what slamming is. 
slamming, 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 slamming. Just in case anybody does not know, slamming is the gay slang for injecting drugs or intravenous drug use. And I'll tell you this, it has such a relationship between stigma and drug use because it's like nobody would ever want to say, oh, do you want to come over to my house, house and inject drugs? Or do you want to come over to my house and use drugs intravenously? You know, that's not sexy. So you see this language developing within the chem 16 that makes the stuff a lot more fetishized, a lot more a lot more uh, sexy slamming, you know? It's like fucking, you know? Um, the next one is, uh, next protective factor that we're going to talk about is setting and safeguarding boundaries, you know? So the ability to know what your limits are before entering a chem sex scene can be a really protective factor uh, against somebody either incurring harm or finding themselves in a problematic cycle of chem's use. So that's like being knowing what your limits are, and then also being able to communicate those assertively to your sexual partners. And the last one would be an appreciation for sober life and sober recreational activities. Now, this is really the most important things when it comes to chem sex. This is basically being able to identify with the importance of your sober life. So that's your family, your friends, your job, you know, the daytime activities, not losing yourself into the nighttime activities, you know. So you'll find with people who have really problematic cycles or patterns of hands use is that they will uh, party all weekends to the point that they really start to lose contact with their friends, start to lose contact with their families. Uh, they drop their volunteering job. Then eventually it starts eating into their weeks and it starts eating into their employment. Find it more difficult to keep up with their work life. Yeah, so really starts to eat away at their sober life. So at all times when people are engaging in, to be honest, any sort of drug use, you should always keep in mind that your sober life in the end of the day is the thing that will bring you the most reward and achievement, a sense of achievement. Okay, any questions before we move on, folks? <laughs> okay, so we are into our final section of today. This final section, we will be talking about sexual violence among gay, bisexual men or sexual men. We'll be talking about understanding consent in queer spaces. We'll be talking about challenges to consent. And we'll be talking about what we can do to support GBMSM survivors of sexual violence. So without further ado, let's talk about navigating queer sexual landscapes. So the complexities of consent in queer spaces, you know, when it comes to discussing sexual consent, conversation is often centered around heterosexual relationships. This is that really, the narrative that's developed around consent over the last 10 years, uh, where it's like yes means yes and no means no it needs to be sober it needs to be assertive not necessarily easily applicable to the queer community or particularly sexual environments where gay and bisexual men of sex and men find themselves you know these are environments where rituals of loves and sex and seduction are often learned through hookup apps and public spaces or drug-filled rooms where the risk of sexual assault is multiplied Gay men even might find themselves having to negotiate multiple sexual encounters at the same time and navigate consent through that effectively. I remember reading this one study, which I always found really funny, which was comparing swingers parties and cam sex parties. So swingers parties being like, um, you know, straight people, straight married couples who are getting together and exchanging partners. And they typically take place in sex and premises venues. And, I thought what was really funny is that, you know, often as queer people, we think of ourselves as really sexually liberated and really far ahead of our heterosexual counterparts. But what they found in this study is that within the swinger space, they had really defined set rules around how consent was to be negotiated, you know? So this was because of the presence of women in the space, you know? Because there was a little bit more awareness, not saying that they're perfect in any way, but a little bit more awareness that they needed to be safeguarding the women. And what they found is that, yeah, they had these really kind of regimented processes of consent. There was about a page and a half within this paper explaining all the different things you had to overcome to negotiate consent. Now, when it came to the chemsex parties, what they had instead is that consent is negotiated through eye contact, body language, nonverbal cues, and it's extremely rapid. So you can imagine with that, it's very difficult for many queer men to negotiate consent. Now you place on top of that, all of the stuff we talked about minority stress model and the vulnerabilities and the low self-esteem. 
you can further understand what places GBMSM at a particular vulnerability to experience sexual violence. And I'll say this again now, gay and bisexual men and sexual men are the second largest proportion, right? I don't know if I'm saying this right. I'll say this, bisexual women are the largest population of people, or are the, are the people, sorry, I keep messing this up. Uh, bisexual women are those most affected by sexual violence, you know? And then after bisexual women, you have gay and bisexual men are sexual men, you know, with really extreme rates of sexual violence around 25% and 57% in different reports. Now, that's not just being victims of sexual violence, it's also gay men are also the perpetrators of sexual violence. So in the next slide, we'll understand a little bit more of like, what are the challenges that are resulting in more sexual violence within these spaces with per more perpetrators implementing the sexual violence. So the first one will be cultural norms and social discourse. Within the queer community, it often presents gay and bisexual men as highly sexually active and sexually assertive. Then this totally normalizes problematic behavior you know, often in the past, I've seen consent-based uh, interventions in queer spaces try to promote consent. And what they found is that there was a big pushback, you know, and in spaces where they really wanted it to be hedonistic and sex and premises venues, they wanted it to be hedonistic and sexually liberated, that you had a pushback from the community, community when you brought up conversations of consent, of people saying things like, well, you know what, I actually like it when my ass gets grabbed, you know, so... This like cultural norms that actually facilitate problematic behavior. The next one will be toxic masculinity. So this is something maybe you're all quite a little bit familiar with, but it basically proposes that the social desirability for sexual aggressiveness can lead gay and bisexual men to accept conditions that otherwise would be considered problematic. The next one will be assimilation. Assimilation. Now, I don't know if assimilation is necessarily the right word, for this particularly this particular factor that's facilitating higher rates of sexual violence. But what it basically means is that because queer men have fought so long to be accepted within wider society and to be seen as normal, it can often be really difficult and you're met with resistance when people are forced to acknowledge some of the more problematic aspects of queer sexuality. Now, the last one would be complex sexual landscapes. You know, so queer newcomers may find experiences in sexual environments that require really complex navigation of consent. So I'm talking about sex and premises venues like saunas or chem sex parties or even cruising areas. If you've ever been to a cruising area, I'll tell you this, they're extremely silent. They're the most quiet place you'll ever be. You could drop a pin and hear it, hear it hit the ground, you know, because nobody's talking. And to speak in these spaces, it's often seen as very taboo, you know? So you, cannot, you can understand that if you can't talk, it can be very difficult to negotiate sex effectively. Now, what are some of the things that we can do to support survivors of sexual violence? Well, some suggestions uh, for overcoming barriers include things like Challenging harmful stereotypes about men and masculinity, you know, that idea that men can't be raped is really unhelpful, or the idea that, you know, men always want sex, or if you have a, an erection, that means you want to, to, to have that sexual experience. So challenging these can be really helpful. Men supporting men, so creating a culture of openness and support, you know, not re as a man or as somebody who operates within the world of men. Um... Like I, I consider myself non-binary, but because I live so much within the queer men community, you're engaging with the structures no matter what, you know? Um, so being able to challenge some of those role, gender roles. The next one would be to encourage men to speak out and seek support when they have experiences of sexual violence. This is both in terms of, you know, speaking out as in sharing your experience with people so that you can receive support, but also we need to encourage more men to speak publicly about sexual violence and their experiences with sexual violence so that we can empower others to move through that experience uh, in a more uh, self-compassionate way. And then also so that we can combat some of the stigma and myths that are present around it. The next one will be to educate yourself and others about sexual violence. It's always important within the organizations that we work within that we fight for some of these more stigmatized topics like chem sex and sexual violence. The next one will be to reach out to support groups or counsellors who specialise in working with male victors. For example, men as well is the organisation I work for. Um, another one you can reach out to is the Survivors Network. That's the next one. 
And the last thing we could do as a community and as professionals advocate, advocate for changes in laws and policies may disadvantage female survivors. Now, what I mean by that is, obviously, we're looking at this within a feminist framework, understanding that women are massively affected by sexual violence. And because women are so far the largest population of people affected by sexual violence, it means that the smaller population of gay and bisexual men and sexual men often get sidelined in the conversation and in the policies and in the services that are being developed. So the more that we advocate for, you know, effective policies that encompass the experiences of the people that we're working with, the better services, uh, the better support we can provide. Now, that brings us basically to the end of the session. We had one more exercise put in at the end, but realistically, we just don't have time to cover it. Uh, we've dived into a huge amount today. There was a lot of information. There was a lot of me talking. So I really hope that you're not too exhausted and that you're able to take some of that in. Before we bring the session to a conclusion, uh, can anybody, does anybody have any questions? Speak now or forever hold your breath. So, how do I say it? <laughs> I had a question, sorry, Michael. Um, I feel like I've been talking a lot. Um, I actually, it was at the very beginning, I thought of something, oh yes. Um, because we were, you mentioned at the start about, um, I guess like the focus of these sessions are around, like a lot of the focus is around HIV specifically, but uh, in relation to sexual violence, I was wondering if there, if you had anything to say about like um, how having HIV might be a, re a barrier to reporting, because I have spoken with some victims of um, sexual assault who've said that when they've disclosed that they're living with HIV when they've attended like a sexual assault unit in a hospital that they felt almost like the clinicians were worried about the perpetrator and like feeling like they had to they felt as though they were giving them a lesson on how to not transmit HIV even though they were the victim of of the assault. I, I was wondering if you've heard any of these kind of things before. I have actually, actually not heard that before. That's really, really interesting. Thank you so much for mentioning that. I mean, I definitely could see that happening as we're ultimately very aware that there's a huge amount of HIV stigma within healthcare, uh, particularly in those who are not necessarily in regular contact with people living with HIV, like a, like a sexual uh, violence centre. Um, one thing that I do see among people living with HIV or that I do have uh, familiarity with is that many people living with HIV who have experienced sexual violence don't often recognize that that was sexual violence or sexual assault. And that's really to do with the low self-esteem that a HIV diagnosis can produce. It's a really low sense of self-worth, you know, can result in somebody not really being having the capacity to recognize uh yeah their own experiences of sexual violence. Any other questions, folks? I'm kind of afraid that everybody's a little bit like exhausted after that. It can be a, like I'm like, I don't know, illusion that yeah, that was a lot of information to throw at you guys. But I'm gonna give you the slides, uh, or at least Ariana will be able to provide you with the slides. Sorry, five minute break. I think we'll need like a day break after this. Um, Ariana will give you the slides and you can contact me via michael uh, michael.d.odea or even just michael at menaswell.nl I'll put that in the group chat and I'm always available for a call you know if you have any other questions or anything like that just let me know and we can pick it up on a private phone call and discuss things a little bit further uh, on top of that, I've attached some more resources to the slides of different websites that dive into this. We have chemsex.nl, it's really comprehensive. Controna Chemsex is an amazing service in the UK and men as well, which focuses on GBMSM, victims of sexual violence. Uh, you can also go to my Instagram for information around these topics. But if anybody has no other questions, I think that brings us to the end of today's session. Thank you.